I realized that I didn't have to do what other people did, and that really outraged people, which I figured was the right idea. Ken Price came up with this as saying, Billy, the only thing you have to do to outrage people is anything. <laughs> Practically everything that I know today, I attribute to motorcycle racing. People say you have to get a degree. I say, where did Picasso graduate from? Where did Miro graduate from? I mentioned a few arcane ceramicists in Japan. Where'd they graduate from? Well, it was different. I said, yeah, it wasn't a school. It, it wasn't something that everybody got to play. It wasn't a game that everybody got to play. They said, no, it's like, they said, that's a religion. I says, no, religion's a game that everybody gets to play. And everybody makes money on it. What I try and do is something that is concrete. It's something that can't be voided. It just exists, it's nothing. It, it has nothing to do other than with your ability to see and to feel and feel relaxed with it. I don't want to tell a story. That's school teaching and fundraising and uh, investing. Universally, people say, you know how much that piece is worth? When you start talking about what the price of your work is, as compared to the quality of the work, it's over. You know, that's investment. I don't have any idea what something is worth. I gotta make lunch. A theory I had when I was young, and it's bear, it bears me out, I didn't figure I'd make any money until I was dead, and I'm practically dead now, and I still haven't made any money. And uh, it, it isn't the point. The point's just a to do it.
But my definition of art is entirely sort of old-fashioned, only I don't even think it's, it's right. It's something that I assumed when I was young, if you were an artist, you were. You, an artist was the person who did it, uh, and not the person who designed it, not the person who drafted it, not, not the person who sent it out to have it built. It was the person who had their hands on it. I'm extremely romantic about the concept of somebody taking it from beginning to end. And I'm very negative about somebody designing something and sending it off. You take lots of sculptures and paintings today that are zoned out, could be redone again and again and again and again. There was some arcane rule about sculpture a long time ago that you could make seven in an edition or ten in an edition and that's it. Well, it's baloney. It's the same with prints. It's baloney. You, could, you know, in the old days when you'd etch, your plate would have a certain amount of time that would last and hold the, the image correctly. That was okay with me if you wanted to make prints, but I didn't see any reason to. The, the, the more I perfected what I was able to do, I could make paintings faster than I could make prints. And when I got through it, I had something attractive that didn't have to be handled with kid gloves or cotton gloves. You know, hose it down, wash it off, and tits. <laughs> I, I chose a profession that I don't really need anything. I just need a s stick or my finger or, or I'm at the point now where I'm old enough to think a piece and have it in my mind. It's all visual. It gives me something to work on. Uh, it's a thing that most people don't understand. If you're working for money, you're not working for anything. I always figure, how do, how do I do it for nothing? My parents settled here when I was in the ninth grade, which would have been, uh, let's see, I would have been 14 years old. So old, so that had been 1948. I'm, I'm primarily Californicated, completely. Well, I was a hotshot ceramicist in high school. So I says, well, I can, I can pull that one off. So I went to City College and I took three courses of ceramics and the rest, and two courses in the gym, and I think I had to take one academic, and I got through that, and I thought all along I'd be a ceramicist, and, and I decided to go to school after two years at City College up at Arts and Crafts, because they had a ceramics department, and I thought it'd be okay. I had to take painting as one of the requisites, so Dick Diebenkorn was a painter there, and and I'd seen one of his paintings because I came up to visit the school and I didn't understand it at all. And I says, well, I guess I got to learn something. I'm still only doing ceramics. I'm just not using the material anymore. And, and if it's out of balance to you, then it'll collapse. Uh, no, I, I, I credit Ceramics and motorcycling is my two, ma two main influences.
This is the middle of winter. I'm standing here in a t-shirt. I can go outside in a t-shirt. I can hang out in a t-shirt. It makes a big difference. You don't have to put on your galoshes. You don't have to put on your hat. You don't have to. In other words, you are not bound in any respect. So we can work 24-7 all the time. We don't have to have heat in our studio. We don't have to worry about shit. And we didn't work primarily under incandescent light. That makes a world of difference. You know, uh, we're daytime kids, more or less. Back east, well, what difference does it make? It's good to turn those incandescent lights on and heat the studio up. Whereas here, we don't have to turn the lights on. If you look outside right now, it's crystal clear, great visibility. And if you can't see, you just get closer to the window. Get closer to the window, east coast, you freeze your ass off. <laughs> I mean, The idea now, as close as I can, I can see, is I, st I start to do something that I don't understand. And when I really get to the point I don't understand and I like the way it looks, and I say, why the hell did you do this? It's done. It, if I understand it and I know what it is, I'm not interested in it anymore at all. Uh, and I figure that I've been looking at things long enough to make something that can be a puzzle for quite some time and visually pleasant at the same visually pleasant is extremely necessary for me i don't i don't understand the art ugly i don't speak that language well th this particular group i i made or fabricated up the the wood pieces maybe six months ago. They sat under the table. I kept looking at them. I said, I think I know what I'm going to do. Right. I did, did that. Oops, we got a little more page here. Um, nice sound. Let me in. Oh, that one fits. You know how many brushes I used on any of these paintings? Not a brush in hand. There are four more, five more of these flats downstairs to be done. And they've been down there for a year because I haven't come up with anything that I think to start with that's going to be surprising to me. No, it, I got to find something wrong first. Then I get, I'm, uh, it's, it's like, the, what, do you, what are you going to do if you're a doctor and, and all, your, all your patients are really healthy? Well, I no, you can't make them sick to make them work for you. And everything's right now seems to be very healthy. Yeah, you know, when, when you're learning, you, you, you always, usually the learning ones are the best ones, but the ones you go, got it. Then I go, did I really do that? Do I want to have that out? Do I, do I, uh, how long can I live with it? That's the reason I brought all those up. I had them up for a couple, three months now, and I said, I, I can live with them. Sometimes 
I'll keep things up for six months, and then I'll take it back downstairs and work on them. Or a year or two. I said, I think I can fix this. Then I really screw it up. Inevitably, I really screw it up. You know, there's no set rules. Once you make a set rule, it's time to break it. I'm, you know, I'm sure you've done this with your own work. You go, I can't do it. Why can't I? I can do any goddamn thing I want to because it's mine. Dorf, and I forget the woman. It looks like Jack Quinn, Jim Corcoran, Bobby Maestro, Jim Ganser, Ned Evans, Joan Quinn, Don Bacardi, Christopher Isherwood. There's Frederica Hunter. It's me with some out. Oh, this is when I was killing the lobster. Frank Geary, uh, Mary Agnes Donahue, Larry Bell. It's Chuck Arnoldi with glasses on. Okay. Me drinking. Jerry Bird on the road. Chicken. Laddie Dell. Jane Kennedy. Ed Moses. Ed Shea. Daniel Benson. That isn't Peter Lodato. That's. Lloyd Hammerall. I'm surprised I can remember these names. I can't remember my own half the time. It was important. It was it was important when it was a gang. It was really important because it's like you have your own kind of Swahili. Nobody else spoke the language. Like all boys, we were competitive, and we liked pulling each other's chain. And we would go, we'd go down to the line when anybody was against us, but we'd cut each other's nuts every chance we got, every chance. You know, that's just the way it goes. It was good fun. Sort of, I think, very similar to. Close as you could come to it is athletics before athletics became real professional. If you if you compared art to professional sports or sports as it goes, there are going to be one or two record holders, and that's it. Well, why aren't there more? Because there aren't. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. You have the gift, you use it. There were so few of us that worked in that team that we became very close-knit. And you could pass the ball. And there was other activities other than drinking. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just how it works. Drinking and hanging out and getting laid were part of it, but it wasn't the whole deal. 
You're trying to beat the other guy. It's, it's basically what it boils down to. Uh, and you know that once, if the guy's that far ahead of you, you got to change, change sports. You go, can't go there. I mean, you can be a great football player, but you're not going to beat Kobe Bryant and vice versa. <laughs> you pick up another sport. And, but then again, you're all on the same team. So there's that support level. I'm going to say to a man, everybody's on their own, on, on their own path. I guess I'd have to say I was head and shoulders above everybody in terms of avant-garde. Uh, Altoon was head and shoulders above everybody in terms of raw ability. Craig Kaufman was a leader two years before that. He opened the doors for all of us. It, it was a game, you know, you pass the ball, da dum da dum da dum And uh, if you look at history, you find that nobody does it alone. They always got something in the background that's keeping them, keeping them rolling. We were, in, in terms, cool in our attitude and athletic in our approach to work. There was an old all-boys club that pissed people off. And if you piss people off, they talk about you. And if they talk about you, then they have to look at you because they have to know what they're saying. And then, then it catches on and then then the group shatters, which it did. Once the, everybody started selling, it fell apart uh, because it became the beginning of what today is. I'm still real old fashioned, I don't give a shit. But I'm afraid the world has done left me behind. In those days, we were RTs, you know. We were effete, half-ass intellectuals. And, uh, there was one critic, LA Times, uh, Henry Seldes, very well steeped, and he went as far as the mid-50s, early 50s, not very much farther than that. Uh, when Art Forum started here, it opened up quite a bit of New York, but not much. Uh, no, New York's a communication town, and New York is New York. It's a big city. And if you wanted to be successful, you moved to New York or you worked in the New York thing. Uh, I had a look at it and turned it down flat. I never went, they took me. Uh, that was, the first show was Martha Jackson's 62. It was very successful and, and I was promised the world. And it, it and it's the best gallery in New York. It's better than Leo. Leo was sucking hind tit to this gallery at the time. And all the, all my artist friends were Leo 
And uh, she said, Billy, I'll get you a studio. You're going to be very famous. And I said to Martha Jackson, I said, Martha, this is not what I signed up for. She says, well, you can't be so famous if you're going to be in California. And I says, fame is not what I'm interested in. Uh, I've never known anybody that's really famous that's really happy. Have you known anybody that's famous that's really happy? Successful is a different story. Respected is a different story. Revered is a big, different story. But I repeated the story to Andrew Warhol. He says, oh yeah, you're going to be very famous. I introduced her to Warhol. That was the funniest story. Because uh, Andy, I guess I was sort of cute too. And he was just hanging around all the time. And I said, Martha, go over and look at his paintings. You, you should show him. I mean, he's going to be hot shit for you. Not, not, no, not for any reason you know, but he will be. So she went over and she came back. She said, oh, Billy, all those green stamps and Uh, Coca-Cola bottles. I didn't like them. I says, go back again. So a week later she went back and she came back and she says, I still can't show him. He's just not my, my cup of tea. I says, well, what's the deal? She says, I don't know, but I bought 20 of them. <laughs> of course, that's $100. <laughs> they were five bucks a piece. <laughs> I, I'm so sad that Andy's dead because he'd be just tickled pink at how famous he is. And, and he, he was the prototype for all the successful artists because he never touched his work once in a while. I, actually, the last time I saw him in New York, I went into his place at the, the magazine. And Andy's back in the back. He, he doesn't want to see you. And I said, where is he? And I says, he's back in the back. And I walked back and he was, He's on his hands and knees putting color with rubber cups. He's so, so embarrassed. I don't like people who know I paint. <laughs> I says, you don't, Andy. <laughs> you, uh, but it, it, he really wanted to be famous. He really wanted to be, and he is. She says, well, you're going to be so successful and so famous. I says, my plane leaves tomorrow. And she says, well, why would you leave knowing that you can be a great success? I says, well, first of all, the surf here is for shit. And, and I have a contract to ride motorcycles and I can make $30, $40 a night and that's all I need. And and it's fun. Maybe it's show business, you know, because you go out there and you, you line up and they introduce you wave with the crowd and you got a guy that starts your motorcycle puts you on top of it points you in the right direction and away you go i mean it was it's show business for me i just absolutely loved it and i got paid good money that's the way i supported myself uh yeah, i could shoot one time i made over 150 dollars and that took me 12 minutes I thought that was really pretty tits, you know.
He played a, an incredibly large role in my life because he just sort of adopted me and then he gave me a job and he made fun of everything I did, which was good for me. And, but then again, he supported me and I just loved it. Ab had all these expressions from racing and he got a motorcycle. He says, I said, what are you going to do with this? He said, Gold Star. Well, I'm going to build it for track. I says, okay, that's great. Who's going to ride it? He says, I'm so looking for a little Italian guy that will put a little gold blower, put a hole in the wall. <laughs> and I says, do you think I could do it? The banks didn't go back and clean the motorcycle. Shut up. <laughs> So I did that, and a couple weeks later, he says, he woke me up. I was living over in a studio with Kenny Price on uh, Pier Avenue. He says, Are you awake? And I says, yeah, I'm awake. He says, you holding your nuts? And I says, no, should I? And he says, yes. He says, you're riding it. I said, oh, really? Am I qualified? And he says, no. And he says, you'll have to learn. Got my first real professional ride and I started racing for money. And it was just oval track racing. I went out there and that's the first time I'd ridden without brakes. Because they don't have brakes. And you generate quite a bit of, of speed in a half mile track. And there are no brakes. I go and I take a few laps and I'm slower in mud. I come in and I... Bob says, how'd it go? He says, you're kidding me. Terrible. I says, what am I supposed to do out there? He says, it's simple. You go to the corner and turn left. I got real good fast. I was faster than anybody else on the equipment that I was riding. He says, Bankston? Somebody passes you, they're either a better rider or they're going to fall down. With that, it cleared my mind. <laughs> I mean, the, the reductive elements of, of that kind of thinking are so important to me. It taught me a different kind of work ethic. I was making more money racing, but shortly after that, I was making more money uh, being an artist. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I broke my back in 64, and I started making money, making art right around 64. And uh, that could have been the beginning of the end. When I was going to start racing at Ascot, I had to bike over at my place to sort of tune it to my ass. And I said, I, I was talking to Ab on the phone, and I says, Ab, I, I think I'd like to paint it red. He says, oh, you can paint any color you want as long as it's blue. <laughs> it's a tribute to Ab, any color as long as it's blue. And 
and he hated the Chevrons. I never knew it was going to turn to this. I really didn't. I thought we'd always be an elite group. But I don't think any of us have garnered the respect we should have. But why should we have it? Because we're not doing what they want us to do. But let me tell you another thing that's more important than this. Our influences came from the East. I mean, the real East, not, not going over to, New, to Europe. Our influences came from Asia. I think it all started with Yojimbo. And uh, we all like that. We all like that. That's cool. You know, here's a guy. It's footloose and fancy free. That when he sees a dog walking by with a person's hand in his mouth, he says, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> you know, now that's cool. And when you're in a, in a situation where there's really no light at the end of the tunnel, the only thing, the only light you have is a sense of humor. And the only way you can express it, you can express it with wry humor and humor that sticks with you. And there's nothing more humorous than spending your life on something that's worthless. Which is what we were doing. We were trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. And I still am. It was so much different in those days. It was. You, you try and impress your friends or piss your friends off or catch their attention. Uh, and that's all that counted. I only cared about five or six people. And uh, if I impressed my friends, then I was happy. And we only catered to our peers. And our peers at one time was the Ferris Gallery until Irving Blum came in. And Irving Blum was a furniture salesman. That's when Ferris Gallery became sort of successful because he started buying the right kind of furniture. And they brought in Rouché and Cornell and stuff like that. It was a close-knit community at one time when we all lived within our means. When our dealers were interested in artists. When you had an art opening and you were interested in going because you wanted to see what somebody was doing instead of being seen. And it's a great treasure. I sold my first painting at the Ferris Gallery for $35. I think the commission was $10.
uh, art dealers took at the most a third. That's pushing it. 30 was usually more or less it. That's before it became a business. It became a thing you ventured into to make a living. And there were a few art dealers who were, were very similar to artists. Walter Hobbs was. I miss those things and I think were Craig Kaufman still alive, Ken Price still alive, uh, John Altoon still alive, it would still exist because first of all uh, it was the way we humored ourselves. It was I'll show you. <laughs> oh, you did that. Well, goddamn, now I gotta step up. It's a different way to stepping up the plate, sort of sort of a game in a way. Uh, when no one's there to play with, it becomes pretty lonely. And a lot of the incentive is lost. As a matter of fact, almost all of the incentive are lost. The reason I switched over to aluminum, and it took a little while, was because my deductive thinking after I left art school and started thinking about these things, oil dries. Once the oil is dry, there's no adhesion. It's not what you call a good stick-up. It's, uh, it's uh, antiquated, stupid material. It's back before they had binders like we have today um, that I, mean, I, I just think of it as uh, old minerals and rocks ground up in, in salad dressing and put on your handkerchief. Basically what it is. It's a real stupid material. Built in the Venice, California kitchen. Right, right, right around 60, 62. Uh, Irwin was painting downstairs here, and he started painting with a spray gun. I obviously was a little avant-garde in that department. I've been doing it for, well, since I was a motorcycle racer. Uh, that was my way of making money on the side from, I'm going to say, from 58 to well, 50, uh, 55, 56 on. I made a little money on the side spraying gas tanks. I'm sort of surprised I'm alive because I have bad lungs to start with. And uh, but I've always been cautious where I could be cautious. But I was pretty reckless. Uh, but it didn't last long. I only did it for, I only did it until other people started doing it. I figured we can let that one go because it's, I mean, once people learn how to spray and know how to do it right, it's falling off a log, man. Anyways, I, got, I, don't, I, I know I don't have that much time to waste. So just putting on that, uh, that suit would be more than I wanted to do. Uh, at one time I invented a spray uh, hat that worked for me, that I carried a scuba tank on my back, that the hose came up like this and I turned the air on, and I had sort of like a bee hat with a little eye hole thing and I'd look out of it and it's open and the air would blow out so I never had anything coming in. So I was using scuba air and I'd spray outside and, you know, well, it gave me, I had 30, 40 minutes of air and I didn't, didn't get the bends. <laughs> I 
at that time was a sort of the end of abstract expressionism. And they talked about the painting going beyond the wall and stuff like that. So if you make dents, it casts reflections everywhere around. I thought, okay, I could paint on aluminum and I could make it real tits. That's not the idea. You have to overcome challenges. It's a lot harder to paint on dents than it is to paint on flat surface. And, you know, all we did is hang out in the studio, so you had to have challenges. If it ain't hard, it don't count. <laughs> I've been 19 while well, Altoon was still alive. Uh, I'd say around 67, maybe 65, well, it might have been 64, 65. But I was, had a little place that I lived in over where the kitchen is, and I had a little wall there, and I had a piece of aluminum that I dented, and I'd spray painted, and it was just matte gray. And Altoon, who came over all the time because I had a pool table here, we played pool for a couple hours every day. He came in, walked through, this way you look, the profile. Albert, that's what he called me. I said, yeah, what, John? He says, when did you do that? I said, yesterday. He says, that's great. I says, John, it's just primered aluminum. He says, Albert, I have no idea what I'm doing, but you're coming in loud and clear. I says, I wish I had your head on. I'm not coming in loud and clear yet. <laughs> John was seeing it a different way than I'm seeing it. And I would see his work in a different way than he saw it. Because many a time he would come over and he says, you've got to come over to the studio and tell me if what I've done is any good. A concept I find a little troubling. But knowing John, the way I knew John, I would just go to his studio and say, I would try and find something that was just a little less good. Because he was going to destroy it. There's no doubt. It's folded, it's stitched. And to this day, you'll find many pieces that are out there on people's walls that are folded in half that somebody has picked up and remarketed them. And I'm not saying they're bad because more often than not, they were not bad. It just, if you work like he did with his kind of graphic sensibility and his insane wit and observation, you can't do anything bad. He couldn't do anything bad. He was too gifted. It, it's sort of like, well, what can I say? If a really gifted musician or pianist is playing, they can't hit the they can't hit the keys wrong. They just won't land there. And that's the kind of guy he was. By denting the surface, you almost you almost can't see the same thing two days in a row, even to go to the same spot because there's always going to be something that's crawling around that's going to change the image. Now, that to me was the, the definition of art at one time, was how to paint something that is attractive in, in a so-called steady environment, but is a world of mystery uh, wrapped in uh, a lie. It's a, it was a, it's one of those things you do when you're young and you try and figure out things and invent the wheel primarily. And, and I still haven't found anybody else that's figured it out quite as well. But you don't need to know what you're doing to send the right message. It's, if you, if you got the right intent, you don't need to know you got a knockout punch. All you need to do is use it. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> but it doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't amount to anything if it doesn't have any aesthetic appeal. Uh, that's the same thing with me is when people say, why don't you sign your paintings? I say, I don't do graffiti. Why would you work as hard as you do on a painting and then put your name on it? That's graffiti. Since 1960, I was coming back from Europe with Bob Irwin. We are coming back and sitting side by side in the plane, and Irwin was talking to me about what he was going to do and these images, these sculptures that are going to disappear and reappear. And finally he says to me, what, what do you think you're going to do when you get back? I think I'll paint Sergeant Stripes. He looked at me and he goes, and he was absolutely aghast, and I said, and he says, what? I said, I, I think I'll just do Sergeant Stripes. I said, don't do that. And I said, I don't know, I'll do him. And he was so outraged, I knew I had the right idea. That's how Sergeant Stripes came about. That, that goes back to the signature. People said, well, why didn't you sign it? And I said, do you ever look in the middle? Because nobody else is going to use a stupid symbol like that. I figured, what is dumber than that as a symbol? And it had a kind of bilateral symmetry, which I like. And uh, it's a design element. And it has many readings. So that, that was my signature for a long time. But the business is a lot about uh, branding. And I knew that I, I had an emblem that nobody else was going to fuck with because it's too stupid. You've got to have something really stupid to uh, I, I've been thinking about what is the dumbest thing I could possibly do. Dumb, nonsensical thing. But I didn't know it hit that hard. You can, if you can get Bob quiet, you've got yourself, you've got yourself a win. I stayed with it for as long as I could, could stand it. I didn't figure it worked with paper, didn't work with any other material other than uh, aluminum and masonite. Don't ask me why I didn't figure that, because I did, didn't. Uh, because arrogant as I am, I didn't think I could make it, every, anything work. Uh, I've, I've proved myself wrong. What's that thing I showed me? <laughs> it's a, uh, anytime you say you can't do it, you better figure out why you can't. And usually the only good answer is I don't want to. Wendy's birthday a year and a half ago, I said, I'll make you a, a present. This house over here. And we put that up. I think in four hours, because I pre-cut everything. And then I put a bunch of watercolors in there. So, so that's Wendy's watercolor room. I said, the last thing I'll ever do is Sergeant Stripes on paper. Well, maybe it's the last thing I'll ever do. <laughs>
I was sitting in Barney's Beanery and they used to have Irish sugar packs on the on the thing. I guess I was a little drunk. And I says, well, that was my favorite flower when I was in Kansas, the bearded irises. They're the most beautiful flower that grew in Kansas that lasted about a week. So I thought about that after seeing the Irish sugar pack. And I was with Keno. I said, I think I'll start doing that. He says, okay. <laughs> and that's how that happened. And then I did one of them, and it was up on the wall. And, you know, because it's got the concentric things around it. Kenny Price, as usual, came in. He says, hmm, looks like the Count coming through the window. And that's why they became Dracula's Count Dracula. Uh, because, you know, how in the Dracula movies there'd be this image of the Count Dracula coming through the door and then <laughs> he'd materialize. That's a lot better than calling them irises. And I was off and running with that one. That's how all these things happen, just conversation. Now everybody is dead or I don't see them and I don't have anything new to go on. I think, I think it's all, this is all bullshit, but that's the way it goes. Uh, anything that's bad enough, I'm willing to tackle. Anything that's common enough, I'm willing to tackle. I started on the Valentine's because I wanted to have a show on Valentine's Day. And I kept with it for quite a while because some woman said, because I had a jacket that had a little Valentine on it, she says, you have a heart on. And I says, I try to all the time. <laughs> I have all the ability I need. I have all the technique I need. I have all the capabilities of getting to the technique that I need. Uh, only thing I lack now is the strength I had when I was 60. Uh, I'm about 75% of that, so I have to work with that in mind. Because most of the work that I do entails See that hand? You see it move? It doesn't. It's pretty solid. That's what I work with. Uh, and the rest is will and uh, Midwestern gumption. Just pull up your pants and go to work. Everybody knows what it takes to make a living in the art world, but very few people who are real serious about it are going to go there. You just got to flatter people's tastes. 
You have to be seen in the right place, do the right thing, wear the right thing, da da da. Well, they don't look at art. They, they look for reference. If they don't read the label first, then the next thing they do is look to see what they recognize. If they don't recognize anything, they move on. Uh, unless they're moderately erudite, and then they make up things that they think they see. So, it's a revolt in development. When you realize that Jeff Koons worked on Wall Street and he has a group of advisors and a new group of work comes out and it goes to auction and it keeps being bid up, does that sort of remind you that maybe there's some working going on in Wall Street? So, I've seen a great transition. Uh, and again, you get in that position, if you can pay for it with money, it's cheap. There's no such a thing as good art. There's only art in the other ship. <laughs>